everyone. My name is Lauren Spath. I'm a first year resident at, at Ohio Health in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm joined here today with Dr. Jessica Spence. She is from McMaster University in Ontario, Canada. Welcome, Dr. Spence. Thank you so much for having me. Today, we're going to spend some time talking about her late breaking research, the Be Free trial, benzodiazepine free cardiac anesthesia and reduction of post operative delirium. I'm excited to talk about it. So um, something that I was interested in, can you tell me a little bit about the background of the field itself and what gets you excited to spend some time focusing on this area? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so when one thinks about benzodiazepines, there are a number of guidelines that have been issued that benzodiazepines should not be used in the elderly and hospitalized population because of their association with delirium. And that's largely based on observational evidence. Nonetheless, guidelines recommend specifically for patients undergoing cardiac surgery that they not receive benzodiazepines before and after cardiac surgery. However, there are no guidelines with respect to intraoperative benzodiazepines. And when one looks at practice, um, roughly about 90% of patients undergoing cardiac surgery in the U.S. and Canada receive benzodiazepines. And that's because benzodiazepines are thought to protect against the experience of intraoperative awareness because of their amnestic effects. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about the primary outcome of the study and some of the secondary outcomes that your team thought about when designing your study? Our primary outcome was the incidence of delirium up to 72 hours after cardiac surgery in the intensive care unit and on the cardiac surgical ward. Our secondary outcomes were really surrogates of delirium as well as benzodiazepine administration. So those secondary outcomes include ICU length of stay, hospital length of stay, and in-hospital mortality. Okay. All important things when you factor in, you know, the cost of, you know, a day in the ICU um, is certainly important, especially as costs are, are rising in healthcare. Another thing that I was interested in, um, some of your uh, subgroup hypothesis groups generated from, I think, your pilot study initially and um, specifically women. I would like to hear a little bit about your thought process on that. And then using the CAM ICU versus the other scoring system that you would use for the nurses to evaluate delirium at the bedside. Um, so we did evaluate, not because of our pilot study, but we evaluated, just knowing that women in general undergoing cardiac surgery have worse outcomes when, with respect to men, uh, we sought to evaluate whether or not receiving benzodiazepines had a fundamentally different effect in women as, a pair, as opposed to men. They do not. Um, similarly, uh, because we use a very pragmatic approach, our research was not an efficacy-based trial. We integrated a research question into everyday clinical care. And so taking into account that pragmatism, we didn't actually have research assistants administering delirium scales to patients. We collected delirium as documented in routine clinical care using standardized and validated scales by nurses um, taking care of those patients. And so recognizing that hospitals use different scales, uh, we wanted to evaluate whether or not the assessment methods, the sensitivity and specificity of those two scales uh, resulted in a significant difference with respect to delirium detection after receiving benzodiazepines. Okay. Did you find that one scale was better than the other? Although it was statistically significant, we did find that the CAM ICU uh, was more sensitive, which is consistent with its its you know its assessment metrics. Okay, great. Um, something else that I wanted to ask you about is, you know, if you think about your trial, um, and I think at this point you've you've come to conclusions that are going to be presented here at the meeting. Um, what are some of the things that surprised you about your results, and what were some things that you expected and you were happy to see? So to be honest, it, you know, going into conducting the trial, I didn't think we would see anything at all. I, the evidence that suggests that benzodiazepines are associated with delirium is very weak and observational. And there's never been a single meta-analysis published that has demonstrated a statistically significant difference of benzodiazepines with delirium. And so I didn't expect to see anything at all, particularly when one takes into account the fact that the doses of benzodiazepine that patients received during surgery are relatively low. Patients received on average four milligrams of midazolam, so not very much, over a very time-limited period, you know, and particularly when you take into account the multifactorial nature of delirium, I didn't think we would see anything. 
And so firstly, I was very surprised to see a fairly clear relationship between receiving this small dose of benzodiazepine and the experience of delirium after cardiac surgery. Very good. So what's next for you and your team? Are there further studies planned or do you feel like this is a good stopping point. So we're in the process of, you know, recognizing when you, when we looked at our study results, we saw a wide variability with respect to the incidence rate of delirium across centers. And I suspect that's likely not because patients were fundamentally different or because some centers had much lower rates of delirium, but rather because some centers were simply better at detecting delirium. And that, that reflects the fact that the diagnosis of delirium is subjective. It's based on a subjective scale, and even the gold standard for diagnosis is still a neuropsychological evaluation, which is arguably more objective, but still nonetheless subjective. And so keeping that in mind, going forward, we're going to be working towards building a biobank of patients undergoing cardiac surgery with the goal of deriving a biomarker that can be used to diagnose delirium, similar to how troponin is used to diagnose heart attack. Wow. That's exciting. I'm excited to see the landscape of delirium continue to be investigated. I think it's a very important area that certainly impacts patients and impacts their families and caregivers that are taking care of these patients that see the detrimental effects of you know, critical illness. Uh, before we go, uh, could you tell us um, a piece of advice that you would, you would share to trainees in our um, journey, you know, the journey is long and figuring out where is my niche? How, how do you think about critical care cardiology as a practicing anesthesiologist and intensivist? So I guess with respect to the first part of the question, I think I would say follow your passion, you know, recognizing that the journey is really long. You know, as somebody who did 10 years of postgraduate medical training, you know, before I had, had actually you know, assumed my staff position, um, you know, it's a long time <laughs> and there are definitely points along the road where you will feel burned out and question what you're doing. But I think the thing to keep in mind is that when you are going through these many years of training, it's important to remember the end goal and why you're doing it. And so for me personally, I sought out you know, multiple fellowships and research training simply because I had a very clear vision of the career path that I wanted to take. And these were the, the training elements that were required to do so. And so I think I would encourage trainees not to be put off of a career path by the, the duration, because at the end of it, it, you know, it's very important to end up with a job where you do exactly what you want to do. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, great. Um, to watch more videos like this, please check out our YouTube channel, Fits on the Go. And also check us out on X at Fits on the Go. Thanks for joining us.